So, uh, yeah, I'll try and give my own talk now, and uh, hopefully it will go smoothly <laughs> as well. So, um, different arm of immunity now. So, focusing not necessarily on, on check blockade and the adaptive immune response, the TSA response, but on the innate side of hepatitis B specific immunity. And um, the role of innate immunity has been has been a, actually a big area of research over the last maybe three to five years. It's really expanded. Uh, before that, it was somewhat overlooked because we were, uh, you know, kind of predisposed to this idea that hepatitis B was a stealth virus and. Uh, and it didn't stimulate a lot of inflammation, particularly in acute infection. And so, you know, it was um, the role of innate immunity maybe wasn't studied to the depth that it had been in, in recent years. But that's changing. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to kind of go through a little bit about um, how HPV is potentially recognized by innate immunity and how this is actually uh, impacting the pathogenesis of the, chronic, uh, the, of the chronic infection. And then the last part of the talk will uh, focus on different angles that might be exploited through the innate immune system for therapy. So there's not a lot that has been developed in terms of treatments for hepatitis B um, targeting innate immunity. I think there is a couple that are, there's one and maybe two drugs that do this, but there are a lot of avenues that might have potential. And that's what I'll focus on at the end of the talk. So as I mentioned, uh, for many years, everybody thought hepatitis B was a stealth virus. It wasn't recognized by innate immunity. Um, but this doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. And there is now good evidence or mounting evidence that HPV is recognized. And so there's been a number of different uh, pattern recognition receptors that have been uh, described to recognize different components of hepatitis B. And so recently there was a publication looking at um, the ability of CD14 to recognize uh, the virions of hepatitis B surface antigen. This uh, can be taken and, and delivered to dendritic cells and lead to their activation to some extent. And there was data now mainly from a mouse model to show that capsids can bind the Kupfer cells through the TLR2 pathway, and, and, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, and this can suppress HPV-specific immunity. Um, there was also uh, a very high-profile publication, maybe last year, in immunity looking at the recognition of the pregenomic RNA, the epsilon stem loop, by Rig I, and the ability of this to actually induce type 3 interferon. And there's also evidence now that um, intracellular DNA sensing machinery, the CGAS pathway, can recognize HPV DNA uh, inside the hepatocytes. So there's, a, there's been a now a, a number of non-overlapping um, receptors recognizing different aspects of hepatitis B. But I think the question still remains is recognition doesn't equate to inflammation. So you don't see, uh, you know, th there's at least in patients no um, constant overload of, of inflammatory cytokines in, in, the, in the serum anyways. And there is some evidence that hepatitis B can inhibit signaling within the hepatocytes through uh, some interactions with HPV polymerase, so the X protein. There are some caveats to these studies. I mean, many of them are transfection systems, or looking at these interactions, they're transfecting and then using different stimuli to activate the toll-like receptors or the pattern recognition receptors. And you also have to think that if it is inhibiting HPV recognition or signaling within this, it's restricted to hepatocytes in many of these, and it doesn't take into context these potential innate immune sensors that are in the PBMCs or the Kupfer cells that still recognize the virus as well. And hopefully some of the new infection systems for hepatitis B will, uh, will help resolve some of these issues and, and really start to understand where if uh, hepatitis B is interfering with these intracellular signaling pathways. The other thing that we have to keep in mind in terms of innate immunity is a majority of patients now are vertical, vertically infected. So the innate immune system has essentially been exposed to the virus before many patients were born. And we had published a paper um, last year looking in the cord blood of babies that uh, were born from HBS antigen positive mothers. And looking in the cord blood of these, we could find that the monocytes in, these, uh, in, these, in, in the cord blood of these S antigen positive um, mothers already contain the viral antigen. And if you look at the genetic profile of the, of the monocytes, uh, 
in these uh, HBS antigen positive cord blood, you can see that they display a genetic profile that's actually similar to an adult, suggesting that the innate immune system is maturing before birth in these, patient, in these babies. And so you no longer have any acute immune response to HBV because the virus and the viral antigen is always present. So what it turns out is that actually the innate immune system seems to actually play or displays more of a regulatory role during chronic HBV infection. And now there's good evidence I'm going to go to in, in the next slide or so to look at where HBV, where, the, where innate immunity actually suppresses anti HBV. And innate immunity actually suppresses anti-HBV immunity and can regulate inflammation. And this is a very significant point when you think about the composition of the lymphocytes in the liver versus the blood. And so being in the liver, if you look at the immune composition in the lymphocytes alone, and starting from this orange line all the way back here to the green, this is what considered innate lymphocytes in the liver. So they compose about 60% of the lymphocytes in the liver compared to in the blood where it's only about 20%. So if you have innate immunity regulating your adaptive immunity, it can have a major impact in the liver. And so where are these, where are these points where innate immunity is regulating uh, HBV-specific immune response? Well, it was just uh, published last year, again, another nice paper from Mala Maini, looking at myeloid-derived suppressor cells at different phases of chronic HPV infection. And they found that they were expanded in chronic HPV patients, particularly in the livers, and these cells produce IL-10 and arginase that suppress um, T-cell responses. And again, I mentioned before that Kupfer cells are recognizing the core antigen, and, and they're producing IL-10 in response to the HPV core antigen. Now, this is in a mouse model, but it did show that this interaction uh, led to a suppression of HPV-specific T-cell immunity in the liver. And another role for NK cells kind of ex expanding potentially on some of the, the, the data that Robert showed is that they have a very regulatory role because the NK cells in chronic HPV uh, can upregulate TRAIL, or, or, and TRAIL is a, an apoptosis-inducing apoptosis ligand. In HPV-specific T cells in chronically infected patients express an increased level of the death receptor for TRAIL, and so NK cells can mediate HPV-specific T cell deletion through a contact-dependent mechanism. So we have these different areas of regulation and potentially areas of recognition. Are there ways that we can exploit these different aspects for immunotherapy? And uh, hopefully this is it's kind of bleached out up there, but hopefully this is readable to everybody. I'm going to go around. There's uh, what is it, nine different potential, uh, potential points using or exploiting innate immunity that might be targeted for therapy, with a couple of them actually already progressing into either phase two or phase one clinical trials. So uh, I'll start here and just kind of go around, um, go around uh, alphabetically with no specific order. But um, again, coming back to the NK cells, looking at uh, the ability of NK cells to delete HPV-specific T cells and showing here some experimental evidence where PBMCs from chronically infected patients uh, expanded with HPV-specific peptides. Um, not unusual to see this level of expansion. This is a positive response, but if you remove the NK cells from this co-culture, you can see a really significant boost in the HPV-specific T cell response or T cell expansion. And adding them back also decreases this. And if you block um, this very specific interaction with the trail blocking recombinant protein, that you can boost this similar to depleting uh, HPV-specific T cells in this case. So really indicating that this might be a way to modulate the expansion of HPV-specific T cells by suppressing the, the cytolytic function of NK cells. Another avenue that we've explored specifically in my lab is really trying to uh, enhance or optimize antigen presentation to conventional T cells. And so in this respect, what we found a few years ago or a couple years ago was that the monocytes in the blood of chronically infected patients contain the hepatitis B virus surface antigen. And if we could activate these, in this case, we differentiated them to dendritic cells, could we, we asked the question, if we could get presentation of that antigen that had been uh, internalized in vivo and use that to boost the patient's own uh, HPV-specific T cell response. And what we found was that in, in a majority of patients, uh, we could induce antigen presentation of the depot that the monocytes had acquired in vivo, suggesting that 
it might be possible to use all this antigen that's in the blood or the serum of these patients as the actual source for a therapeutic vaccine if we can provide the right combination of immunomodulation. And then the next uh, a couple I'm going to talk about are really um, directly targeting pattern recognition receptors, the toll-like receptors. And so this one, it's interesting that many of these drugs have taken so long to be developed because we've known, yeah, I guess uh, it's been more than 10 years now, that if you inject toll-like receptors into mice, you can clear HPV from the uh, transgenic mouse liver. And so there's, there's clear scientific evidence that activating these, these, these pattern recognition receptors can have an antiviral effect, um, and they're beginning to be realized now. So the first one I'm going to talk about is TLR8 uh, stimulation. And so this is another uh, pub study that I was involved in, and what we found was that if we activated intrahepatic monocytes through uh, TLR8, we found that they produced a lot of IL-12 and IL-18. And these cytokines led to uh, indirect activation of NK cells and uh, mucosal-associated invariant T cells, mate cells, and then induced them to produce a lot of interferon gamma, uh, which is the primary antiviral mediator. So in, in doing the study, what we did was you know, took mate cells, um, these are from healthy donors, and then put them in combination with different antigen-presenting cells from the liver. So either monocytes or myeloid cells, B cells, myeloid DCs, or plasmacytoid dendritic cells. And uh, interestingly, only the monocyte population was able to stimulate NK cell and mate cell interferon gamma production. And when you looked at these cells in the total culture, this could be a significant amount. So looking at almost 40% of the mate cells and NK bright cells producing a lot of interferon gamma in this case. And if you blocked IL-12 or IL-18, um, either with the mate cells on the left or the NK cells on the right, you could, you could reduce this. And so this uh, shows us one way that we can stimulate the production of interferon gamma, but also produces IL-12, which I mentioned in, in the previous talk, can have really profound effects on the HPV-specific T cell response, potentially providing two different avenues of immune reconstitution. So then the other, the next TLR is the TLR7 pathway, and this one is certainly the most advanced, um, and this is the Gilead's GS9620, which is uh, well into clinical trials right now. And, and this is the TLR7 agonist given orally that its focus is to activate TLR7 on plasmacytoid dendritic cells and induce interferon alpha production. And so this is just some data from the last publication in chronic hepatitis B patients where they gave uh, multiple ascending doses of the GS9620 looking at an interferon alpha, or the interferon-specific response in the PBMC, seeing that you could get a nice dose-dependent and time-dependent induction of the antiviral, um, uh, the antiviral gene, the ISG15. Uh, there was no effect on viral load, I think, in this study, but it was quite small. Then uh, moving around, the next one is a little bit unconventional because there hasn't been a lot of work done on it. It's been, it's been in the mouse, but I think it's, it's interesting um, because it, it, is, it is coming back to this innate effector cell, and these are the NKT cells. And what they found in the mouse model here is that if they were infusing NKT cells into HPV transgenic mice, they could induce a lot of inflammation. And if you're familiar with the different populations of NKT cells in the mice, it wasn't this kind of classical V-alpha-14 invariant NKT cell, but rather a, a CD1D restricted T cell, which uh, also potentially exists in humans. And so it was this interesting population of, um, uh, of T cells that seemed to mediate the inflammation. And if you remove this non-classical MHC molecule, CD1D, you could see here good response, but then uh, eliminating its, its target recognition on the hepatocytes, you could, you could reduce that. And so I think um, this is an interesting aspect, but it re will require more information first. Then uh, moving on, uh, where am I? So moving over to F, looking at um, the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And as I mentioned um, previously, this is some work from Mala that was published uh, just last year. And these cells are expanded in chronic hepatitis B, and their main mechanism of action is really producing arginase or IL-10. So arginase uh, degrades essential amino acids in the, and prevents T cell activation. And so similar to the other experiments that I've shown, this is 
expansion of T cells from chronically infected hepatitis B patients uh, using the overlapping peptides to the virus. And so after 10 days, you get decent expansion of these cells, but if you deplete the myeloid-derived suppressor cells, you really see significant expansion of the virus-specific T cells. And then adding them back clearly suppresses that expansion. Um, and if you block this arginase pathway, in this case, using an inhibitor of this, it shows that you can uh, also re restore that T cell functionality, that T cell expansion of these chronically infected patients, providing a, potentially, um, a potential mechanism to target to promote T cell expansion. And the next one is also focused on uh, Rig I, so tar targeting a pattern recognition receptor that is expressed in not only hepatocytes, but kupfer cells, monocytes, dendritic cells, and uh, really trying to stimulate uh, an inflammatory reaction and an antiviral effect, for instance, through interferon alpha production. And so this molecule is actually being uh, uh, Springbank has a molecule that uh, is moving into clinical trials. It's a rig I agonist. And they just recently published some data looking at the chronic infected woodchuck model. And here, these were uh, a 12 week dosing of the SB9200 in this animal model. And you can see that it was both um, a dose dependent and time dependent reduction in viral load in these animals, but also. Uh, a one and a half log reduction in HBSN or uh, woodchuck hepatitis virus surface antigen after the 12 weeks of um, after the 12 weeks of treatment. So the mechanism of action here is is is, is um, presumed to be through interferon alpha production, but Rig I also stimulates to, uh, type three interferon and a number of other inflammatory cytokines. So then the last one is also focused on activating a pattern recognition receptor. In this case, it's uh, CBG and TLR9. And this was work from Percy Nola's group, where if you injected uh, TLR9 agonist, CPG, you could see that it induced massive expansion of T cells in the liver. And they formed these clusters, which were dubbed imates, so T cell expansion zones in the liver. And one of the ideas and one of the concepts, and I, th I think is important for targeting the innate pathway, is you can use this kind of uh, environment modifying approach with CPG and then combined it with a hepatitis B virus vaccine in a chronically infected mouse model. And what they found was a very effective reduction in the, uh, in, 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 in the chronic infection in these, mouse, in these mouse models. So it's pretty obvious that I went through a number of different pathways. And so there are obviously multiple mechanisms that can potentially be exploited uh, in the innate immune system. A lot of them require further development. And I think that they have the potential to really have direct antiviral effects. But what's seen in that last uh, slide with CPG is that I think it's going to be important to modify the immune environment of the liver, too, to promote any antiviral effect, particularly if we're talking about CD8 T cells and, and allowing adaptive immunity to proceed uh, and, and eliminate the virally infected hepatocytes. And of course, the concern with targeting innate immunity is it's inherently nonspecific. And so it may be difficult to identify therapeutic windows, and, uh, and, and it will almost uh, lead to some level of inflammation in the liver. And it's going to have to be a balance between you know, the controlling the antiviral effect and the, the systemic toxicity. And I think, you know, with innate immunity playing such a significant effect of potentially regulating adaptive immunity, we need to understand better what's regulating the regulators. So we don't know the mechanism that's controlling potentially the expansion of MDSCs, for instance, in these chronic patients. Uh, and so, you know, understanding these mechanisms better may allow for uh, us to relieve the negative regulation by innate immunity and potentially promote a more organic immune response versus a therapeutic boosting, which may or may not be more toxic. So that's it, and I uh, thank you for your attention, and <laughs> we'll take a break.